Good morning, and thanks for joining us on Behind the Gav with Jason today. Today, I'm really excited to be joined by Scott Jones. Scott Jones is a professional benefit auctioneer uh, joining us today. And Scott, thanks for being with us. Oh, so nice to join you, Jason. Thank you for the invite. Um, exciting to be uh, be a part of this, and hopefully we'll have some fun and share some good, great things. Absolutely, absolutely. For those of you who don't know Scott, he is a partner in uh, Raising Paddles Fundraising Auctioneers. He's been in the auction business for more than 18 years now. You see those letters behind his name there? Uh, CAI is Certified Auctioneers Institute. He and I both have earned that designation through the National Auctioneers Association. BAS is Benefit Auctioneer Specialist, another NAA designation. And CFRE is Certified Fundraising uh, Expert. Executive. Executive. I knew that wasn't right. As soon as I was saying it, I knew that was wrong, um, <clears throat> which is we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. During Scott's uh, time with Raising Paddles and partnering with other organizations around the country, uh, he's worked for and with the American Heart Association, Ducks Unlimited, St. Jude's Children's Hospitals, Boys and Girls Clubs, Ronald McDonald House, American Cancer Society, CASA, which is Child Advocates, uh, and many, many more. Um, Scott, thank you so much again for joining us. Why don't you tell us real quickly kind of what led you into the benefit auction space? I know, you know, auction is an auction, being a, coming an auctioneer is, is appealing to a lot of people, but what led you to becoming so passionate about and in, interested in and invested in doing benefit auctions and how you got to raising paddles today? Sure. Uh, so I became a professional auctioneer in 2004. I graduated from Worldwide College of Auctioneering and uh, spent the next 12 years um, selling estates and cars and real estate. Um, and uh, back in 2016, I was diagnosed with renal cell carcinoma uh, in my left kidney, they, which they ended up removing that. And, uh, and that totally just um, enlightened. It put, a, it put, a, put an illuminating uh, uh, aspect on what I wanted to do uh, with the rest of my career in life. And so uh, I went to Vegas uh, to a designation course offered by the National um, Auctioneers Association and, um, and started looking into some of the designations and found out that I was interested in learning more about the benefit side of auctioneering as I had been a part of all the other aspects. I said, oh, let's see what's going on with this. Um, and as I entered into that, I partnered with um, Bobby D out of um, Arizona at the time, went over and showed him my auctioneering skills and my floor skills and just had a great time and really, really enjoyed it. Happened to be that night for a, a local cancer organization, helping those that are living uh, with cancer and their families. Uh, so it just, I left that night feeling remarkably good. And even though I enjoyed the auction world for 12, 15 years, um, it was always the connection with the individuals that just inspired me. So uh, this just seemed appropriate for me. And as the auction world itself started to kind of move away from the bid calling and the state on stage performance in front of large crowds, this seemed like a perfect fit for me because it offered exactly that. Uh, so I spent the next two or three years studying what it meant to become a benefit auctioneer and then just created relationships with certain individuals. Uh, I met Dan Campbell, who was the founding owner of Raising Paddles out in Vegas uh, during that conference. And we spoke and uh, three or four months later, he called and asked me to be a part of Raising Paddles. And, th and that's been the journey uh, into the benefit world. And that's what I focused on for the last uh, five and a half, almost six years now is specifically nothing but fundraising events, special events, helping nonprofits uh, raise much needed funds uh, for their, uh, their, their, their important causes. Very cool. You mentioned a couple of things I want to swing back on and touch on. Um, one of the things you talked about partnering with Dan Campbell and Bobby D. And I know if you look at Raising Paddles, there are several auctioneers there. I find you on other uh, benefit auction websites uh, as a partner or associate. That's not something that you see in most areas of the auction industry. Tell me a little bit more about that. That's just really fascinating to me as somebody who specializes in your know, art, antiques, and jewelry. How does what prompted that kind of those those company associations with other powerful auctioneers? It seems uh, kind of interesting and, and and great. Yeah. So coming out of uh, ownership of my my original auction company out of Virginia, and then I, I owned a United Country franchise, which was uh, real estate centric. Um, 
when when I decided to go into the benefit world, I just realized for me it was it, it I was I was tired of all of the ownership side of it and you know managing individuals and being responsible and accountable for employees and their lifestyles and those kind of things. And so I just realized after years and years in the auction industry that there are certain individuals that complement each other. And mm-hmm. so what I did was I started to just um, strategically seek out individuals that I felt were, would be a good match uh, and just started having open lines of communication with them. Uh, one of the things that auction industry itself sometimes lacks is, is level of trust between uh, each of the professionals and this ownership of this is my zip code, don't come into it. And the cool thing about the benefit space is, is that, you know, there was so much opportunity, so much, um, you know, last year, 2019, I was in 62 different cities doing wow. uh, uh, doing galas. So, you know, I stopped looking at my my stage as a dot on the map, which was a zip code. And I saw the whole world as an opportunity. And um, and at the time I was single. So it was it was it just made sense. I was able to travel. Um, so, again, I, re- I reached out to individuals with the same vision, the same mission you know, the same morals, the same kind of mindset, the same kind of heart set. Um, all the partners that I'm with now all have had some type of tragedy in their life with their family, either are cancer survivors or or, or something that just make makes us all attached to, together even greater. So it, it was such a, such a good cohesion. And then just a lot of times if I wanted to get in and help individuals, I just pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, I, you need some help. I'm here. I won't charge you the first time. Just let me come over and, and be a part of your great evening, be a little part of your success. If you like what you see, you know, I'm available for you in the future. And if you don't like what you see, well, it didn't cost you anything. So, uh, and that worked really well for me. Um, I'm, I'm super, super animated on the floor, super excited on the stage. So most of the, the relationships continue to, to dwell and dwell successfully. That's and I, and I love the way you how you looked for and, and, and the people you've worked looked to partner with, uh, having a very similar heartfelt uh, connection to helping other people raise money. I think that's really super important and 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 super strategic, right? I mean, if you, it's one thing to call an auction; it's another thing to be passionate about the auction you're calling. And and I know from the videos I've seen and talking to you and some of the other partners in various platforms over the years that that passion is definitely there with all of you and your partners and colleagues. Uh, you talked about a couple of different things there. One thing that I thought was interesting and, and a topic we're gonna to talk about, let's just jump right into it. You mentioned that you'll oftentimes donate your services to an organization for the first year. If they like you, you can pay you uh, going forward. Um, brings up a, a really hotly contested topic in the fundraising auction world, or it has been. I don't think it's nearly as, as uh, uh, unusual as it was was, but Tell me the difference or why it's important to hire a professional benefit auctioneer as compared to a local celebrity or the, the person who's really, you know, given a lot of money to the organization and they want to reward them with the night on stage. Tell me why it's important uh, and our viewers, why it's important to hire somebody who is more than just involved with that organization, but actually does this for a living. <clears throat> sure, that's a great and thank you for asking it. And it, it's certainly in the industry in itself and, and, and extending into the nonprofit space where individuals um, see the professional auctioneer as, as an expense line item. And, and we, want, we, want to, we want to be an investment. We want to present value so that you see uh, the real need to partner with, specifically our partners with Raising Paddles and other benefit auctioneers. And the celebrity, uh, the celebrity auctioneer or the celebrity uh, guest that's going to take on stage, the honoree or whatever, uh, they're going to be with you that one night and that in the in those few hours, um, and they're going to bring notoriety to uh, to the organization, may give it a little bit of press, you know, that 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 helps. But they're not drawing the individuals that are necessary to meet your goals to the room for the right reason. And that's what the auctioneer, the professional benefit auctioneer does, is that we're there with you 24-7. You know, we're there with you the entire year. We see ourselves as a partner, as, as a member of the organization, and we want to be with you six months after the event. We want to be with you three months and nine months after the event. We want to help you create relationships with the individuals. And, and fundraising is all about relationships. Um, and it's the same thing in any auction world, but really in the benefit space, fundraising is all about building relationships. 
And unfortunately, the, the celebrity or the talk show host or the guest um, constituent that just it's going to be there that night, uh, they're, they're going to be the only relationship they're going to have is with you. And our goal is to create relationships between every one of your donors and potential donors so that we can see greater uh, results for you. So we're going to add a little bit more than just the night of. We're going to be there through, you know, 20, 40 hours of consulting so that, you know, yeah. we can help you your special event. That's so important uh, for people to think about and, and consider when they're planning their big galas. Um, and one of the things that I, I saw um, an endorsement or a quote on your website from one of your clients. And it said that even though you guys are the star of the show, you don't consider yourselves the star of the show. And I think that is a huge difference. Two points to that uh, between a celebrity person who's doing it one night compared to somebody like you who does it for a living uh, is that you are not there to be famous. You are there to raise money. Um, whereas the celebrity is there to be famous. That's their role. Their job is to be the face that people recognize. And, and that's a cool thing. Secondarily, auctions are about sales. And a celebrity isn't in the sales, but auctioneers, we're innately trained on how to draw extra money out of people in a crowd uh, to engage them. And that, you said the relationships with not only the organization, but with the patrons and the, and the guests in a particular evening is so crucial to going from $4,000 on a trip vacation to 7,500. And those kinds of differences make such a huge difference at the end of the night. And I see it again and again and again when I go to events run by uh, or working with professional auctioneers. Uh, is that, is that, do you see the same things or is there more to those points or? Sure, no, that's perfect. Those are excellent examples of, of, of the effectiveness of a professional auctioneer in that setting. Um, and, and whenever that I get the opportunity to work with a celebrity or, or one of the nonprofits, you know, informs me that there's going to be a celebrity there that night and we need to make sure that, you know, that, that we cooperate and, and work with them. My, my direction for them always is that's wonderful. That's great. You know, is this individual going to create momentum in the room? And auctions are all about momentum. Now, yeah. even though there's way more to a night at a gala than the auction itself, there's way more revenue generators, certainly some that could even be considered uh, more important. But the idea is to create momentum, create inspiration, create that, uh, that opportunity that compels individuals to give, whether they're raising their hand in, in, a, in a competitive environment that's you know a live auction item, or whether they're just raising their hand, giving freely from the heart. And, and what we see is, is that there's sometimes there might be a disconnect from that celebrity individual from how to actually strategically plan that motivation. How do you keep that moment, create that momentum and then see that it escalates and keep it going right through the end of the night. And the part of that is, is that you've got to be able to read your crowd. You've got to understand that. You know, not everybody there has ever been to an auction, as you and I know, selling grandma's pots and pans or selling a fine piece of art. Um, so, you know, it's understanding that there's a ton of different variety in the room and we have to be able to, you know, we have to be able to connect to everybody in that space. Yeah, it's so important. And like you said, the momentum, the flow of the evening, understanding when you can push a little bit more and when you can when you need to rein it back a little bit. Appropriate comments or inappropriate comments. Um, uh, alcohol consumption by celebrities is a huge issue. I've seen that happen before. So it's so it's such a, a crucial thing for people to remember when they're considering their event. Uh, you you said that in 2019. Oh, do you have some, go ahead, Scott? Did you have something to say about that? Uh, Jason, I'm sorry. I'm looking at a little bit. Of the, welcome to technology, especially with the virtual world that we're all living in. I'm having a little difficulty with. Uh, with your last question. Can we try it one more time? Sure. So uh, I was transitioning to see, so you said that in 2019, you said you went to 62 cities. Uh, obviously in 2020, I've seen you be, be in some cities at some galas, uh, but by and large, we are in a different world and you're going virtual and, oh no. So hopefully Scott has gets logged back in here really quickly. Um, but to reiterate what we were just talking about, there he is. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I don't that's know what's right. going on. Everything is well. well that's, so, yeah, so I think the point is that's that, technology, that's COVID, but that's exactly what I'm going to ask you next. Um, you traveled to 62 states last year. 
uh, cities this year, obviously not nearly as many. A lot of the events I'm seeing are virtual online. What's that transition been like? And some of the setups I've seen from you and others in that in, in that space are amazing. Look like TV studios in your homes between the cameras, lights, monitors, the whole nine yards, the sound system. Tell me a little bit about the transition to virtual. Um, and then how are your clients reacting to that possibility and also patrons? Yeah, so a lot of it, and you know this well, Jason, that with change comes fear. And that's the biggest hurdle um, because there's a lot of unknowns. And certainly um, over the course of the last seven to eight months, um, Raising Paddles, we've we've done approximately uh, 80 virtual events. Um, and wow. coming out of the coming out of the right out of the uh, COVID uh, announcement with the initial lockdowns, there was a there was this scramble, this mad dash of trying to just put something together because you know many times the the gala or the, or the event is their biggest fundraising event for that particular nonprofit. So uh, fortunately for me, uh, I had been in the auction world long enough to totally. Uh, uh, accepting and execute the concept of online uh, live stream auctions where we have a live component and a online component. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very comfortable space for me. Um, and I, matter of fact, uh, my last three years and and with selling estates was in Scottsdale uh, in a very in a high end gallery there. It was all live stream. And so we so it was very comfortable for me. But what we had to do is transition the nonprofit into how do we uh, how do we connect the donors now from a, a large gathering space into you sit at home and you watch us on a computer or a television or your smartphone? And so over the course of the of the last months, we you know we've we've overcome some challenges. We've seen some real need. Uh, and the main thing is this: we've slowly educated the nonprofits that you can still have a successful event, and it can be totally virtual. Uh, you know, for me, virtual was just like. Um, a new word. I mean, I'm like, this is just live stream online. I was very comfortable. And, you know, most of the nonprofits are using hybrids and those kind of things, which is all cool. It's nice. Um, but, you know, just coming with that, again, that professional auctioneer who has that enriched background where, you know, part of this is all a part of growing. And so eat what we did and the Key word for 2020 is pivot. So we helped those individuals pivot into the virtual space. And, and the real success was recognizing right out of the gate that no longer is audio visual in a, in a ballroom. Everybody says, oh, if the audience can hear you, you need a great mic, you need good speakers. Well, we knew that we needed a great production team. So uh, we've hired actually three different production teams across the United States that work with us full time. Uh, most of my events, I'm in El Paso, so I, I can I can transmit 2,500 miles away into Chicago. I did one in New York. I've been in California. I've been in, in um, all over this United States. Um, Atlanta, we did one. So, and all of that is really two blocks from my house in a local studio. And and we just left it to the professionals. And the only thing we had to do is bring in uh, and, and make them understand that this is not necessarily a production for TV or something like that, but it's about an, uh, but it's about nonprofit. Time is essential, so you know we just modified our our run of shows and our and our program time, and we just made it as audience as centric as possible. And with that, uh, we've created some really success stories. And matter of fact, um, you know, uh, you know, we hope that it'll all go back because human interaction is so important in the in the philanthropic space. Um, but the virtual space is creating huge success stories for many of the nonprofits, so they de desperately needed it. I was going to ask next, how are the patrons and the attendees reacting to the online virtual aspect of it? Yeah, the so the nonprofits themselves are, you know, they're they're accepting it and then they lean on they lean on us greatly to to guide them and 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 walk them through because this is so new to them and this is all unknowns and which again very scary. We try to take a lot of that pressure off of them and let them focus on fundraising. So in order to do that, then we bring in those constituents those supporters, those not those donors. And what we do is we do a ton of work prior to the day or night of the event, communicating, reaching out to them, having conversations with them. Um, now, there is a lot of uh, what we call donor fatigue, uh, whereas that individuals are just zoomed out. They're just they're tired of sitting in front of 
televisions and computers and watching that. So again, it's about being creative, um, connecting to the right people. Again, I mentioned that early on in the, in the podcast or broadcast is that connecting with the right people. So really you can have 50 people on a zoom call and raise more money than you've ever had in, in that, in the, so the idea is more now than ever is to harness and, and create that relationships and that what we call donor cultivation and stewardship. Absolutely. I think it's very similar to the online auction versus a, a, a traditional auction. Targeting the right audiences is so much more important than getting masses of people. Sure. Uh, and yes. it, and it, it sounds like it's very, very similar to the benefit space. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't you, want to you, you don't want to advertise a gun auction or a firearm auction mm -hmm. to, you know, someone who's necessarily looking for furniture, those kind of things. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a target audience. And, and we and we certainly want to support them in trying to identify who those are. Absolutely. So one of the other things we want to talk about today, Scott, was all those letters behind your name um, in education, you know, CAI, Certified Auctioneers Institute. You and I both went through that. It's the most intensive program the NAA offers. Benefit Auctioneer Specialist, you know, there's only a few hundred people have attained that designation. Uh, but the CFRE, tell us a little bit about that and what prompted you to go there? Because you are the first and only auctioneer to have that designation. Is that correct? That is correct. What prompted yes. you to do that and, and, and what was that program like? Yeah, so um, good things do come out of 2020, obviously. this. 2020 has, has been a very uncertain time in our lives. And so during the downtime, I I, come, I have a master's in education. So, so I just have a love for educating others and myself. And, and the NAA has done a tremendous job in offering um, opportunities to for designations, certifications, those kind of things to just kind of help you know move us in, up in the industry as standouts. Is like we're truly committed. We're truly committed as professions in the industry. Unfortunately, uh, you know that it works really well in the auctioneer space. Auctioneers recognize it. Auction attendees recognize it. But the nonprofit world just said, "What does that mean? What is the BAS? What is the CAI? We never heard of that." You know and we have to think about how many nonprofits exist in the world. And, you know, with $316 billion being raised last year, that I just needed a way to have to, to, to create a bridge. How do I, how do I bridge the gap from auctioneer and ambassador, advisor, consultant into the nonprofit space with something that they understand? So through several months, maybe even a year of research, I just found that, they recognize the CFRA, which is again certified fundraising executive, as the top of the top. Only 7,200 people in the entire world hold the designation, um, and that's from 20 different countries. And so I wanted to be able to connect and talk to the nonprofits because as we moved into this virtual space, we've all auctioneering is always involved. And you know that Jason, you've been in there the longest time. You've seen that. You've seen you know the move from the live auction into the online. You know, there's, Well, Scott's going to join us again, I'm sure, in just a second. Can you hear me? Absolutely. So, sorry, but anyway, so the auctioneer world is always evolving. Well, guess what? So is the rest of the world, especially the nonprofit. And for the, the need in the virtual space for an auctioneer to stand up on stage and sell for 5, 10, 15, 20 items was starting to diminish. And where the real need was that, that, that connection, that relationship building with nonprofits and their donors that lead up to the event and then what you do after the event. So it's no longer becoming a single night event. It's, it's, the night of the event is the culmination of all the hard work you put into it. So the CRFE uh, just, um, it just allowed me to uh, be, enter a space that now I understand how the nonprofits work from the inside out. Now I can talk their language. Now I understand their challenges. Now I know what the board is responsible for and what the CFO and, this, and the chief development officer and what it means to, to actually donor cultivate and donor stewardship. Now, about the course. Um, I have been, an, I am an auctioneer and certain licensed in eight or 10 states. I forget the count. It's not bragging, just saying that in each one of those, there's some type of either reciprocity, but you have to start somewhere with the license. We've all taken some kind of test. I've been a real estate agent or broker in 10 or so states, and I've had to take all of those tests. Uh, I have a master's in education, so I've taken that test. This was absolutely the most 
intense, um, difficult test that I have ever encountered. Um, and, and fortunately, I came out the first time successfully. Um, but I spent a lot of time studying, a lot of time reading about stuff that was unknown to me, was new to me, new, new, but so I went, I decided if I passed, it was great. If I failed or was unsuccessful, it didn't matter because what I learned in my studies just positioned me in such an elevated space with my nonprofits. I already, I already sensed myself talking to them, connecting with them on a, on a greater level. So it, it's, it is an intense, um, intense uh, opportunity. Um, there, you have, the application itself is not easy. Uh, there's, a, there's a ton of uh, work that you have to have done uh, and to fill out that application, three, four, five years of experience. And then, um, it's, and then it's a matter of studying multiple books, multiple um, course studies and those kind of things. And in the end, uh, I do think it's where the nonprofit world for the auctioneers is shifting is um, the NEA has done a tremendous job again in offering uh, levels of education that they seem suitable for auctioneers. But as we move and as we evolve in the fundraising space, um, I, just, I just was starving for something that would connect me greater to the nonprofits. And now, um, just within weeks of passing this, um, there's been a ton of opportunity that has arisen um, because the need is so great. Um, and so it's uh, so it's an exciting moment. It's still very fresh, very new. I don't know that I've totally, um, I totally understand the full capacity of what what's to come. Uh, but it was a great feeling. I've got tons of um, acknowledgments and, and congratulations to many of the people in the auction world and also in the nonprofit world. And so I, if you're looking to to elevate your education, and again, this is the only internationally. Uh, acknowledged and credited certification in the world for nonprofit business. And so mm. if you're serious about your business, why? that's my goal. If, I, if I'm serious about this, I got to go for the best. And that's me. I'm always, always going to try to be be that trendsetter, be the leader. And you probably see me lead, do some trendsetting the last four or five years, Jason. Absolutely. Well, I think it's, you know, it reminds me, my wife, Stacy is going through the PMP program right now, which is project manager position. Um, and it's very much like what you talked about. She is studying every night, um, every weekend. She has different apps. She's taking practice tests. She's doing all these things. And she's been doing the work for a long time. Like you said, the application process for that is very similar. But there's so many parts of it that she's never touched on before. And even if she doesn't, like you say, pass the test, the knowledge that she has gained and that you have gained is so critical and crucial for establishing those long-term relationships and telling your clients in a very um, easy to understand way how important the work that you're doing is. And I commend you on that's what that's the reason I reached out to you. I've had I've had Trisha Brower on the show and she's very passionate about it as well and teaches and, and has taken a lot of courses. Um, and I, I just think that uh, the, the work that you and, and Trisha and others are doing in the benefit space is elevating it almost beyond the auctioneer space um, in that it's it's becoming its own. <clears throat> you know, its own thing outside of being an auctioneer. And it's it's exciting to see how diverse that world is, how open and, and interested in change they are in a way to help those people who those organizations all help. Because the thing about all nonprofits is they were put together, established and organized to help other people. And I think that's such a great thing that you and your, your colleagues and, and others are doing. So uh, Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, oh, thank you. Go ahead. My ultimate goal, um, Jason, is to, you know, is to be able to share this uh, opportunity experience with many of my colleagues. Um, and it's not for everyone, um, you know, but it is for those that are passionate and, and who see themselves um, becoming deep, more deeply rooted in the nonprofit space uh, and being seen more as a true professional um, and a, and have that credibility. That is that right now is lacking in the nonprofit world, um, and it's unfortunate because I think the professional auctioneer is is one of the most. I, I could not pick a better profession. I, I you know it's you know I sat by people on the plane you know all the time, and they're like, oh my god, you're an auctioneer. You're that guy that talks really fast. And we all experience that because the, the life of an auctioneer is just that. It's on a pedestal because it's such a rare breed of individual, and so. But once you find your niche. 
uh, which I think I have, and then it's like, now we got to focus. And, and so hopefully I can share this with, uh, again, those colleagues that want to be a part of this. And, and maybe this will be the start of that spreading the news. Absolutely. And folks, if you're watching, you have questions for Scott, you can reach him at scott at raisingpaddles.com or give the office a call or him a call at 480-540-1989, which he told me is your graduate of high school. So he will always be a year older than I am. And uh, I'm sure I know that regularly going forward. Yeah, I have more gray in mind than I did last year, but not as much as you. <laughs> uh, you can also find Scott and Raising Paddles on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And Scott, I don't know if you had a chance to watch any of my shows before. I like to end the show this time of year, especially asking my guests to share something that they're really thankful for. It's been a crazy year. Uh, we've all had to pivot, which I, I, I think after, you know, after the vaccine is out and established, I'm never going to use that word again. Um, but Scott, why don't you tell us, you know, one or two things that you're really thankful for and anything else you'd like to share with our viewers about you and fundraising or anything else? Yeah, I guess the most thankful, uh, thing for me is the ability to smile and to bring mm -hmm. smiles to other. That's, uh, for me is, to see people happy, to see relationships, even in this, uh, you know, these challenging times, uh, to see individuals draw closer together. I'm, I'm so thankful that uh, that my, my that my friends, my family, my auctioneer family uh, are also very supportive, and and that we are the solution to so many so many in, uh, problems for, especially in the nonprofit world, and, and extended into the, all the whole auction space. Um, so to to just be a part of something that is beneficial to others or benefiting others is uh, is is super super important to me. I, I'm a huge family person, and and that means extended family and immediate family as well. Uh, to be able to share successes uh, and and to be able to you know to live through this uh, this this pandemic um, and be able to still provide. Uh, again, happiness to those is, is what I'm truly thankful for. I'm thankful that uh, I'm a four year, four and a half year cancer survivor, and I'm able to uh, connect more deeply with the nonprofits that I work with just based on my own personal um, uh, story. And so it's uh, to share that story uh, is, is, a, is a great gift for me. And uh, and I'm just you know I'm just I'm just I'm just a happy person and I'm in, I'm in El Paso I get to play tennis five six days out of the week still I'm wearing shorts most of the time so it's just it's just uh, you know God is good and and I'm thankful that I'm a believer uh, I don't know if that's appropriate on here but I don't really care um, I'm a believer and it just you know He continues to to just provide the faith and the mercy that we all need. And, 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 and I just hope everybody uh, comes through this, works through this and just, you know, just plants their feet deep and say, this too will pass and it's not the end of the world. So. Beautifully said, Scott, and congratulations on the four and a half years of being a survivor. That's so important uh, and easy to forget sometimes. Um, but it really is a great thing. And thank you for being on my show today. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for watching Behind the Gav with Jason today. If you have questions for me or my company, info at kcauctioncompany.com. You can always call us at 816-283-3633. If you have questions for Scott or myself, other episodes that we've had, or ideas for guests coming up, we'd love to hear from you about that as well. And of course, this is Behind the Gavel with Jason. Scott, again, thank you so much for being with me today. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Jason. Have a good right. uh, holiday. and and. Here. Absolutely. Thanks.